the Fatima miracle. There are things you should know about it. Here to discuss the Fatima miracles, a man who has re just returned from Fatima, Portugal, L.A. Marzulli. Great to be here, Gary. Thanks for having me on. You know, we've had a, a discussion on a previous program mm -hmm. about the Fatima miracle, and we talked about it for 30 minutes and really didn't come to the end. Uh, but we did come to, uh, I think, a good stopping point where we need to talk about what really happened at Fatima that's relevant to us today in the 21st century. Well, we are told in, in prophecy in, in our Bibles that Satan comes with all signs and lying wonders, that there would be false signs and miracles in the, in the latter days. And it's up to each person to decide, you know, as they examine the evidence that we have in the film, was this a false sign and lying wonder? my opinion, it was. It certainly wasn't the sun, and we've talked about that in the last program. The sun didn't leave its place in, in our solar system and descend to Earth. Everything, the entire solar system would have been eradicated and there'd be nothing left. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about it if that was the case. So something else appeared, and as we, we stated last time, according to a, a numerous eyewitnesses who were actually there in that field, October 13th, 1917, upwards of 70,000 people, and they're waiting for something to happen because they were told that something was going, something miraculous, wondrous, would happen on the 13th of October, 1917. 70,000 people are waiting. All of a sudden, it's been raining all night. Every, all the clothes are wet. People, there's a sea of umbrellas. We show that in the film. Lots of umbrellas, you know, black and white. Uh, even on the, the cover of your DVD, right. you've Shows got a, that. a photographic reproduction of the crowd. Actually, uh, who's going to go out in uh, in the morning at sunrise and, and wait, and wade for through, hours, wade through the mud and get soaking wet? You've really got to be motivated. Dude. And and people are soaking wet. It's been raining all night, all morning, and all of a sudden, around twelve o'clock. The clouds part and there is the sun, and, but nothing is happening. And then another cloud comes in front of the sun. And out of this cloud comes an object, a metallic object, which begins to spin and throw off colors and descend to the earth and then eventually do a flyby. And as we discussed in our last interview, we've got witnesses that state, I looked up and saw a dull silver disc. And remember, in 1917, there's no words in the lexicon for UFO or flying saucer. Right. That wouldn't come till, you know, decades later. So people say dull silver disc because that's what it looked like. It was a dull silver disc. And we even have a, a priest who at the time was a young boy, later on in life, he becomes a priest, and he says, the disc turned uh, from into a tan color. The disc turned to a tan color. He calls it a disc. So it's not the sun that descended. And because of that, and all the other phenomena that, that's linked with the so-called miracle of the right. sun, that's what we found interesting. And it did a flyby. <clears throat> we talked about that last time. It did a flyby over the crowd. Sounds like an air show almost. But when it did, it apparently radiated some kind of heat that dried out the clothing of the people who were present. But it also uh, caused skin burns. Skin and burns, it, yeah. And it popped out uh, automobile windshields. It caught... Uh, nearby parked cars on fire somehow, uh, maybe heating the oil, you know, in the crank or the gasoline. In the, I don't know. They don't they didn't say apparently, but we're talking about what seems to us in the 21st century like a technological phenomenon. That is to say, something with great power that had the ability to radiate heat is going to set cars on fire. It's going to do skin burns on people, mm -hmm. and it's going to dry their clothes out. And we don't think of anything supernatural when we think of that. We think of uh, like a, an energy projecting device of some sort. And that, that really happened in 1917. It happened. 70,000 people that were in that field, their paradigm, their worldview was completely rocked. Completely rocked. Changed. Many people were terrified at what was going on. There was nothing in their paradigm to... What am I looking at? Remember, there's no aircraft in Portugal in 1917, maybe one or two planes. Most people in that field were illiterate. Most people couldn't read or write. They were illiterate. 
And yet there were lawyers and clergy and, and, and medical doctors and dentists who were learned, who looked up, and their testimony is on the record, and they stated, and again, we go back to the 1917 documents, which are handwritten right. from the witness testimonies, looked up and saw adults over this. So what are we to make of that? We have, essentially, with all due respect, we have two Fatimas. We have the Fatima that most people know, think yes. that they know, that it was the Mary of the Bible who appears to these three children, and there are secrets which were revealed. And then the original Fatima, which is completely different. The entity never says she's Mary, number one. Number two, when asked, where do you come from? She says, I come from the sky. And the way she was dressed was provocative. We talked a little bit about this in the film. I'll probably get more into it in part two. But the entity, and, and I, again, I'm not trying to disparage anyone's belief system. You can believe whatever you want to. But according to the eyewitnesses, according to Lucia, uh, Francisco, and Jacinta, who were the three seers who saw this, this being, this entity, she appeared with a short skirt, slightly below the knees. Hmm. And when, when Lucia and the other seers told the priest this, they were taken aback because... In Portugal at the time, 1917, prostitutes didn't wear dresses like this. And when we go back into the historical record and we look at pictures of the goddess Diana, the hunts, huntswoman, right? She's wearing a short skirt. Now, I'm not saying what was there was Diana. We don't know what was there. But I don't think it was Mary of the Bible, in my opinion. And if it wasn't, um, then what was it? And this this troubled the the, the, the parish priest greatly because... What do you mean she had a, a skirt just below the knee? And that, so, that really troubled uh, them. Maybe we're edging into the goddess mythology, the goddess mm -hmm. ethos uh, of some sort, which has always been on the dark side. Uh, we think of uh, Diana of the Ephesians, you know, the, and the, her followers contested Paul in Ephesus. And, and, uh, and of course, the, the worship of Diana uh, went way, way, way back and, and went all through Europe. As, and, and in a semi-literate class of people in the early uh, 20th century, uh, you could easily find that sort of worship going on. So now, this brings us to something I, I really want to talk about, because apparently there were various phenomena that we would call psychic phenomena mm -hmm. involved in, in this whole event. Mm -hmm. Let's go into that a minute. It's interesting, uh, and, and we discovered this when we were there. We actually met with a psychic who um, hails back to the 1917 group of psychics um, that met. His, you know, he's like a modern counterpart of what happened in 1917. It's the same group. These group of psychics were meeting. They call themselves spiritualists, and they were conducting seances in 1917. And there was a group of them that were meeting, um, and they were engaged in automatic writing. Automatic writing, we are told in, in the Bible, things like this we're not supposed to engage in because we're contacting entities which are, in my opinion, first of all, demonic and highly malevolent. So in Deuteronomy, we're told not to engage in necromancy, which is basically what this right. is. And these, these men and women are together and they are writing um, from right to left, okay, something that's very difficult to do, like Da Vinci did, and that you can only see in a mirror. The mirror image. It's a mirror image. So it's right from left, and they sign it, the entity which is giving this message, which states something wondrous will happen on May 13th, 1917. So it's calling out the date with great specificity. It's a setup. So why would, why would something benevolent and wonderful, why would the God of the Bible choose mediumship to announce something that's going to happen? That's, that's mixing the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. So yeah. you can't have it both ways. And the fact that the mediums published this in the paper in Lisbon announcing that on May 13th something wondrous was going to happen in Portugal and it was signed Stella Matutina, the bright morning star. Hmm. And that in itself is, is controversial because we know that Jesus is called the bright morning star, but not so fast, citizen. We also know that Lucifer is called... Uh, the light bringer. And it, it, gets, it gets very complex, but in my opinion, this was demonically charged. Um, this so-called letter, this announcement, um, and I find it very curious that on May 13th, 1917, something did happen. And, and it happened for a reason, and perhaps we don't know the reason, but 
uh, we're talking about uh, a a globe on fire in 1917, the era of World War One, uh, sure. One and social upheaval. And uh, 1917 just happens to be the year of the Bolshevik Revolution, which began a killing spree that ended up killing 100 million people. Right. Uh, so 1917 was a pivotal year, and this would suggest that there was the dark side was aware of something large that was taking place at that time. Again, not trying to disparage anyone's belief. If people want to believe in, in the official events of Fatima, they're, you know, we're, not, we're not twisting anyone's arm here. You can believe what you right. want to believe. But the research that we uncovered, the, the psychic, the whole dynamic of the psychics coming together and writing about this, I find very troubling. And I think most Christians who know their Bibles would also find that element of the story extremely troubling because it's there. Stella Matutina. And something else that we discovered, which again is not part of, most people don't know this, the day before May 13th there was another apparition site where another entity appeared. Hmm. So there are hundreds of apparition sites all through Portugal. And again, even before the Roman times with, with the goddess Diana, there's another feminine deity, which is their mora, and she is worshipped, and she has priests who are castrated priests. So this, this whole matriarchal society is steeped in antiquity through Portugal. I would even go far, as far as to say it's a territorial spirit like, like Paul warns us in Ephesians 6, which has never been deposed, ever been deposed. It still reigns. And uh, for the time being, is, is sort of staying quietly in the background. But the power is there. And, and in fact, as you're talking, and I'm looking at my Bible at Ephesians, <clears throat> and we have the whole story in Ephesians of spiritual warfare. In fact, the whole uh, epistle of Ephesians is uh, all about spiritual warfare. <clears throat> but if you want to read about spiritual warfare, you read about the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness in heavenly places, mm -hmm. and what they do. And the book of Ephesians talks about how they are engaged in what, what might be called a propaganda war. And the book of Ephesians is not usually called an anti-propaganda epistle, uh -huh. but that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul, from cover to cover there in this little book, talks about the behind-the-scenes powers. And as you're telling your story of what happened at Fatima, <clears throat> to me that's what's happening. There is some kind of large-scale event that did something that maybe we're not fully aware of at the time of all this revolution in Europe, 1917. You've got some very troubling dynamics in the original 1917 records. You've got the psychics, which are predicting something, and signed Stella Matutina. You've got, when, when Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta see this, this entity, um, she's communicating, first of all, voice to skull, telepathically. I find that incredibly curious, because we know that from the biblical account, when angels appear, there's no telepathic nonsense going on. It's, it's like the angel speaks to Mary, you know, um, and the angel speaks to Daniel. There's, it's not, telepa you know, telepathic. I find that very curious. So you've got uh, Stella Matutina, the psychics, you've got the idea that this entity is communicating telepathically with the children. You have the dynamic where the entity is wearing a very short skirt. And then, of course, the miracle of the sun, a another misnomer, it's not the sun which appears that day. And you've got all the phenomena which is going along with that. You've got the drying of the clothes, the drying of the ground, the breaking, the shattering of the windshields, the hoods of the cars flying up, the engines spontaneously combusting. People were terrified at what was going on. And so again, in 1917, people had never seen anything. There's no way to, to people can process this kind of information. It's, it's completely, and, and no one is sitting there challenging this. No one is saying, in the name of mm -hmm. Jesus, you know, leave. You know, the Lord rebuke you. No one's doing that. They're just standing there in they that are. field and accepting whatever comes. And the purpose of what we're trying to do, that's why I call it a harbinger of deception. 
Because we're told all signs and lying wonders. Satan comes with all signs and lying wonders. If that's true, and we're moving into that time, 1917, the Balfour Declaration, think about that. Yeah. Israel coming back into the home right. just decades later. The enemy can see this, and so he's positioning himself, and I think that's what Fatima yeah, was and about. You, I'm glad you mentioned the Balfour Declaration, 1917. Everything was changing very rapidly in, rapidly. in that particular year. And it makes sense that the demonic side would be disturbed. They want Very get, much so. They would want to get their, their input in, if at all possible. And where to do it uh, better than a small, sort of primitive country, out of the way, but a, a situation set up which would affect the whole world. And, and you, there you have it. And it, it, by the way, if you really want to get into the details of this, uh, I, I highly recommend uh, this DVD that uh, that uh, has been put together. It's called Fatima, Miracle of the Sun, or Harbinger of Deception. L.A., uh, I think, has outdone himself on this one because uh, it, it's more than a documentary. And, and you go behind the scenes mm -hmm. and you talk to people who most of us would never even know existed, let alone talk to. And uh, they document what went on. I love the, the, some of the people there, uh, PhDs, you know, who have actually gone to the trouble to diagram what happened, and you show the diagrams and everything. It's remarkable. What they did is they took pictures in the field. Um, photographers were there, and there's this what's called a flyby, when this object, which I believe was a UFO, a dull silver disc, yeah. what does that sound like, did a flyby, 100, 100 feet over the heads of the crowd. Yeah. That's not the sun. We wouldn't be here. So this thing flies by, and we have photographs of where the people were. And by this, um, uh, Joaquin Fernandez, Fina de Armana, and others researched right. this. They looked at the pictures, and they plotted, and they were able to contact these people. They contacted the people decades later, and they went and asked, what did you see? And this is what's amazing about it. There were... Um, there were all these witnesses, 28 people, who came on the record talking about dull silver disc, spinning disc, silver orbs, bright shiny orbs. That's what, I mean, that's what is in the record. And they have certain phenomena which happens to them. Their clothes are dry. They, have, they hear the buzzing of bees. Um, they have the, a sense of euphoria. All these, you know, 28 people, slightly different things which are happening to mm -hmm. them. You know, physiological things. So it, it's it's a fascinating study, but it was not the sun. And what's interesting to me is that there are seventy thousand UFO witnesses, <laughs> basically, yeah, <laughs> and scared to death. Uh, people from a, you know a primitive rural uh, society, and they would have to be thinking, "Wow, this is of God somehow." So there you have a, a fascinating story. Uh, I want to break over into another area at this point in time because you have devoted much of uh, the last few years of your life in, in documenting the UFO phenomena in general all over the world. People are experiencing it in different ways. Uh, the military is experiencing mm -hmm. it, ordinary citizens, people, your next door neighbor, people you might not think uh, who... who who have much to say if you could ever get a chance to talk to them, and you did. Uh, in, in the Watchman Chronicles, D, uh, L.A. has produced this DVD called In Their Own Words, and essentially uh, it's interviews divided up into different sections in this DVD, but in, in this DVD series you, you just have conversations with ordinary people who've had extraordinary encounters. And when you're through watching this thing, you're changed. It, I, it changed me to watch those people because Thank they you. are pe so believable. And let's kind of bridge over into that for a minute. Sure. What do you think, uh, after talking with so many witnesses, eyewitnesses, ex experiencers, what's going on? We have everything from people who have seen orbs as they're driving in an orb. And, and, and Wesley San Giorgi does a brilliant job of bringing this all to life through his computer graphic imagery, which is just incredible, CGI. And one story, this guy uh, you know, uh, is, is driving, and all of a sudden he sees this orange orb, orb way in the distance, and it's night. It's like 1 in the morning. And they're staring at it and looking at it, and pretty soon this orb just leaves 
where it is and flies up and they're driving like 60, 70 miles an hour and paces the car. So it's in front of them and in a blink of an eye, it's next to the car and it's like, you know, four or five feet in diameter and it's glowing and it's next to the car and everyone's looking at it and they're not saying a word. I call that UFO brain fog. They're not saying a word. If you and I were there, we'd be going, oh my gosh, what's that? The rebuke first, ask questions later. Yeah. That's what we would do. <laughs> but they're mesmerized, there's that word, mesmerized by it. And then, and then he says something which is just completely illogical. He goes, when the orb left, we didn't say a word. We just concentrated on our driving. Hmm. Completely irrational. Completely irrational. Yeah. I call that UFO brain fog. We interviewed a woman and she, this is when she's very young, and she's going to a dance, a church dance. There's a bunch of girls in a car, and like something like 10 or 12 girls, a big station wagon in a car. And as they're driving to return everyone home, okay, they see a light. And the light's pacing them. And un unfortunately, they pull over, and they get out of the car, and the light's there. And they realize that it's not a truck, it's something else. And they begin to get scared. They pile back in the car, and this woman tells her sister who was driving, quick, let's get out of here, let's get out of here. And then she says something again, UFO brain fog. We were speeding, but we weren't moving. Hmm. We were speeding, but we weren't moving. And then she arrives at the place where she's going to drop off the girls. She's got three hours of missing time. And the woman comes out, the mother comes out, irate. Where have you been? You were hours late. And she's going, no, we, we weren't hours late. So we've got time displacement. Al Matthews comes on the record. Lifelong abductee, he's been taken from a very early childhood. And he flees the eastern coast of Canada to the western coast, Vancouver, to try to get away from the phenomena. He's terrified of this thing. He wants to be left alone. One of his episodes he talks about, he drives, again, UFO brain fog. He drives past his exit on the way home from work no discernment, just drives past it. And of course, later on, the entire car is taken aboard a ship. And he awakens from that, and it's like four or five hours later, the car is floating down from the craft, floating down like this, lands, starts itself, and drives itself until Al is awake enough to grab the wheel. That's the kind of interviews we have with people. And we had one person who's in, in MUFON and ufology and has actually written books. And after she saw the film, she said, LA, I, I realize that I have to come across the line. And this is absolutely demonic. To me, uh, that's an amazing admission. It really is. Uh, th th because someone committed to documenting a phenomenon in a particular way has, has a change. Wait a minute, wait a minute, this has got to be spiritual in nature. And, and it is. It's demonic in nature and it's from the dark side. And it, it's happening. UFO sightings, for those of you who don't know, have reached an all-time high. Fox News. Not some move on report. Fox News. Did a whole little two... I should actually show that in my presentation. It's a two-minute little clip. UFO sightings have reached an all-time high. And they give you all the numbers. So something is going on and the church needs to wake up, in my opinion, and begin to talk about it. This is the coming great deception. There are people who document uh, UFO appearances. One of them is named Peter Davenport, sure. a gentleman who's been doing this for years on his own time, on his own dime, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. He's not a member of any foundation that, that is supported uh, with millions of dollars. He just does it because he thinks that it needs to be documented. And he is, has reported consistently over the last two or three years uh, the uh, the exponential increase in sightings of all kinds. So some something's afoot. Something's and, about to happen. And again, I want to read Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, uh, where, where Paul just says, uh, finally my brethren, this is verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now we, we read that uh, we want to stand against the wiles of the devil. We read that and we visualize, well, what might be the wiles of the devil? He might try to tempt us to do something that we shouldn't do. He might uh, break our will so that well, maybe we're caught cussing or something. You know, wiles of the devil are used to, are kind of little minor temptations. Uh, they're thought of, uh, I think, in, in classic ecclesiastical terminology as being mm, day by day temptations. 
But when I read about the wiles of the devil and, and what, what Paul then says, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in this world, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Who would that be? Well, that's exactly what you're talking, this exactly. whole phenomenon. Right. And that should be planted squarely in the middle <clears throat> of uh, a pastor's relationship with his congregation. Mm -hmm. Because he's got to warn his congregation. He has to, and most churches are not. And most churches are not doing yeah. that. And right. that's that, why we that, made the film. We made the film really for the people, but also to wake up the pastors. And you've got to preach on this <clears throat> because uh, Satan is a, I want to call it a technological reality. Uh, when you talk about something appearing and disappearing, uh, what are you talking about? Well, you're talking about interdimensionality. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Having, let's say, a technology that's advanced enough that you can step from this dimension into that one. And Satan and his minions seem perfectly capable of doing that. And we shouldn't think of that as black magic or anything else. It's just that that's the way they're put together. They, they, have, they possess uh, the knowledge and the power to do this. Mm -hmm. And when they abduct people, and by the way, you do speak of abduction in the interviews on your DVD. Absolutely, sure. And everybody poo-poos the abduction, uh, abduction phenomenon. Uh, I got Some guy says he got taken out of bed and, and he was hauled through a window and the window wasn't even opened. And you immediately dismiss it as some kind of wild imagining. But really, it's, we're talking here about reality, correct? Absolutely. And the church needs to wake up that there's a there's a agenda, a very dark agenda by the fallen one himself. I call it the coming great deception. And as you and I have talked about, there's plenty of time for the rapture in the church, and then those who remain will be deceived. And I think it's coming. LA's DVD, The Watchman Chronicles, in their own words. Uh, I don't know how to tell you. Uh, how important this is, but when you hear these people, people like yourself, uh, having these experiences, honestly trying to express what happened to them, it's going to change the way you look at uh, the dark side. Along with uh, uh, this amazing DVD, Fatima, uh, Miracle of the Sun, or Harbinger of Deception, these two DVDs are going to give you a perspective. Uh, I think it'll even show you how you should be praying to seek the Lord's will in, in this dark world. And also, uh, we have uh, the Watchers series, 11 DVDs of LA's work over the years. It's an 11 disc set. And by the way, we're putting this together as a package Fatima and the UFO Deception package. You'll find it in our online bookstore, the 11 disc set. And with that will come free, in their own words, and Fatima. All of this is going to give you a kind of perspective that, that you really need. Now, we're not talking about spooky, otherworldly things. We're talking about spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. L.A. Marzulli, the adventurer, uh, the man who goes to the source and finds out the truth, and he's uh, driven to do that, and I'm glad he is. He shares his work with us. L.A., we'll talk to you again. Thank you, Gary. And I'm Gary Stearman. You keep watching. We are. <laughs>